Amen. I tell you what, there was one song that we sang this morning. Um, the lyrics were, if creation were suddenly articulate. I had a moment this morning where I experienced creation suddenly being articulate. I have to tell you about it. So I'm an early riser, and I got up this morning, and it was like 5 o'clock in the morning, and I happened to see through the window, I just glimpsed that the stars looked incredible, like like incredible, incredible. And I wasn't satisfied to just like peek through the window in my pajamas and, and get the glimpse that I had. So I got on my big winter coat. You have to know, first of all, I'm from Southern California and I don't like 40 degrees. Like anything south of 55 is foreign to me and I freeze. So, but I did, I went outside and I stood in my front yard and I looked up at the sky. I was like, this is crazy. Like it was you know when you watch the movies and it's like the romantic scene and then they're looking up at the sky and you're like, oh, for the love, it's so cheesy. Like the sky never actually looks like that. It was like that this morning. I am telling you, like hundreds of stars and I'm no astronomist or anything, but like I know I saw the Big Dipper, I saw the Little Dipper and there was, the moon was so bright and so clear and it just, I felt like it kept calling me back to it again and again. And then there was a star opposite the moon in the western sky that was just like so bright. Dan said maybe a planet. I don't know. I, I, was, I came this close to waking up my son and my husband and saying, you have to come outside right now. You have to experience this. And when, I, when Dan, I know, Dre's like, no, thank you. And I didn't, so you're welcome. But when Dan did wake up, it was still dark. And I was like, do me a favor right now. Go outside. So anyway. It was amazing, and this Southern California girl was willing to even go outside and, and check it out on this fall morning. So this is your invitation. If you guys are up around 5-ish tomorrow, you might want to check it out. It could change your life. I'm just saying. So we have just finished our series, the Redemptive series, and we talked about how we're all part of a redemptive story. There's this great story that God has been writing for all time, and you and I are written into it. Each one of us gets to experience redemption in our own lives because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And we, they talked about then how we're on a redemptive mission. You and I get to, as, because we're redeemed and as we are redeemed, walk into the world and share who Jesus is to the world around us. We get to be a part of proclaiming the redemptive story to the world. And we are, thirdly, a redemptive community. We're the place where people come in and they don't have to be perfect. They just get to come in here and discover alongside us what it looks like to follow hard after Jesus and to, to be changed, to have our lives changed. And we're starting a brand new series today. It's called Rooted. What needs to happen underneath the surface in our lives so that we can be the redeemed people that we are meant to be? Today's message is called You Are What You Think, which you may think, that's awesome. And it could be, or it could be awful. It depends what you think. Let's pray. God, we just are so grateful that you come when your people gather in your name and we're here and so are you. And we're asking right now that you would help us to focus our minds on what you have for us today, that we would be able to hear from you. I ask, Father, that in a special way that you would just remove distractions from our focus and from our ability to be able to, to think on what you are sharing with us today so that we can walk away changed. We are excited for what you have for us. We love you, we worship you, we trust you. Amen. So my day job is I am a morning show host, which means I get to have a lot of conversations of faith throughout the day. For three hours every day I'm on the air. But I also have this radio job, part of my radio job is that I have to give the weather every 15 minutes. It's not my most favorite part of my job, but it's part of my job. It's just one of those things you have to do. So I've got a big screen in front of me, and then I've got another screen over here, and one of the windows open on this screen is the Weather Channel's current temps. So I can report you know, how that one degree is gonna change your life in the last 15 minutes. Um, so anyway, right underneath the current temperature, there's this big banner, it's an ad, and that ad is displaying for all of my colleagues and everybody else who comes into the studio, what I'm thinking about. You know what I'm talking about, right? Like you Google something and suddenly it's everywhere. Like we upgraded our phones and so phone cases, I'm looking for a phone case for my new phone and it's just like 
phone cases, phone cases. Every company thinks that, you know, wants to get my attention and wants me to buy their phone case. You guys experience this, right? It's not just me. Yeah, the stinking algorithms, right? It's so frustrating that like the interwebs knows what we're thinking at all times. But this doesn't just happen on screen. This happens out in the wild. This happens in our lives. Have you ever walked into a dealership and, and you're looking to buy a new car and you see this car, it's so unique, it's so cool. You've never quite seen this color. You don't, you've never seen this make and model on the road before. And you're like, that's the one, I have to have that one. It screams me. You buy the car, you pull out of the lot and they're everywhere, like everywhere. Am I right? Yeah, okay, so it's, it feels like God just said, cue the Ford Taurus and the they just invade the planet. But that's not what happened. It's actually happening in our brain. This is the way that our brain thinks. I was reading an article about it this week from Debbie Hampton, and she said, your recurrent thinking patterns physically shape your brain's form and function, which then reinforces and encourages more of the same kind of thinking, which again, could be awesome, could be awful. Depends on what you're thinking. But even more interesting than that is that our thoughts affect our lives, the effect that our thoughts have on our lives. Harvard psychologist Ellen Langer studied the effects of thoughts on hotel maids. So there's this group of maids who every day are bending, lifting, vacuuming, working, going up and down stairs, lifting, carrying things up and down stairs. And she had a conversation with them, and 67% of them said that they didn't think that what they did qualified as exercise in any way. So Langer told half the group of the maids that the activities that they were doing actually met the U.S. Surgeon General's definition of an active lifestyle. The other half were not informed of this information. Both groups keep doing their jobs day in and day out. A month later, she checks up on them, and this is what she found. The group who had been told that what they did qualified as exercise saw a decrease in weight, and waist-to-hip ratio, and a 10% drop in their blood pressure. The only thing that changed was their view. They kept doing the same routines, the whole group. So according to Langer, if you believe that you're exercising, then your, your body responds as if you are. I'm going to drive differently from now on. I'm just gonna tell myself while I'm driving, this is a great workout, look at that, getting my cardio in. You can change your body according to what you think. Doesn't this just blow your mind? This is good stuff. It is. It's really good if you want to get healthier while you're driving. But what if your thoughts are not so good? What if you think, I'm never going to amount to anything. I just mess up everything that I touch. Or what if you think, I'm just actually not that significant. I don't think people actually even see me. I don't think that I matter. How does that impact your future? If we are what we think, then what we think really matters. Can we create a different outcome by changing what we think? Is it possible to change your mind and change your life? We're gonna talk about that today, and the answer is found in scripture. So turn with me to Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. And while you're finding that spot, I want to tell you a little bit about the book of Romans. It was written by a man named Paul, formerly known as Saul. And he had this radical encounter with the risen Jesus. And he was so excited about it. He couldn't not tell people about who Jesus was. So he traveled and he told people everywhere he went about this Jesus. And he formed these faith communities in these different pockets. And he would often write letters to these faith communities. And the Ro Romans is his book to the church in Rome. And he very specifically wanted to encourage this group of believers to focus on the faith. They were a very diverse group at this point, and he And they were different things. They were splitting hairs, if you will. And he was like, focus on the gospel, focus on what God did for you, that all humanity is trapped in sin and needs to be saved and we cannot save ourselves. But God's righteousness has rescued us through Jesus, creating a new ethnic, blended family, multicultural covenant community of God. He really wanted them to focus on that. Okay, that catches you up to where we are, Romans 12, one and two, which reads, therefore, 
I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. What stands out to you from this passage? Let me read it one more time and, and look for a word or a phrase that just seems to grab your attention. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Go ahead and jot on the back of your bulletin if there's something that got your attention. Jot it down so you don't lose that. But I would love to share with you a couple of things that stood out to me. One of them is that Paul, he told them the why, he told them the what, and he told them the how, all in these two little verses right here. The why, he said, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. He's saying, I have I, this whole letter, 11 chapters, has been laying out how good God has been to you and how you don't deserve it and how while you were still sinners, wow, yeah, you were still sinners, Christ died for you. The motivation for what he's about to tell us, the what, the motivation is gratitude to God for what he's already done. You can't earn God's love for you. He makes that really clear in the whole first 11 chapters. You can't do it. You can't save yourself. But you can live your life in such a way that you show your gratitude to God. And, and Paul's so, pa he's a passionate fella, if you know anything about this man. He's so passionate. But he says, I urge you, I urge you. There's an urgency. He's pleading with them. He's begging them. There's passion involved. Don't wait. Get about this right now. So what is the what? <laughs> he says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Live your whole life for God. The message version says, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you, take your everyday, ordinary life, you're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work, and you're walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. He's saying, in view of what God has done for you, because he is so merciful and he is so good, Give everything you are to God. Give your whole life to God. We have an exterminator that comes to the station, takes care of our bug situation out there, and he was with us a couple weeks ago, and he was sharing with me that every single call he goes on, whether it's a residential call or a personal call, every time he gets to go out and he gets to care for a facility, he says, I want the people there to know the love of Jesus. And then he kind of leaned in and he goes, I am a missionary cleverly disguised as an exterminator. <laughs> Don't you love that? You are a missionary cleverly disguised as a banker, as a real estate agent, cleverly disguised as a grandma, cleverly disguised. You, we have so much admiration for missionaries who sell everything that they own and move to another country and start a whole new life and rightfully so. But guys, this is what we are called to do. We are missionaries cleverly disguised as a, right here in the Gun Lake region. This is how we're to live. And Paul's super excited about it. So he says, live your whole life for Jesus. And then he tells us how. I love this. I'm a practical girl. I want to know the how. Let's get down to it. And Paul doesn't, doesn't mess around. He tells us, do not conform to the pattern of this world and here's how you do it. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you're going to change your life, you'll have to change your mind first. Right thinking leads to right living. Your mind is actually the control center of your life. Whatever has your attention has you. Our thoughts become our words. Words become actions. Actions become habits. Habits become our character, and our character becomes our destiny. So Paul says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. 
our mind is actually the battlefield. And battlefield is where enemies come together to fight it out. You have enemies fighting for what is taking up capacity in your brain right this very moment. And you always do. You have three enemies. You have your own thoughts. Your own thoughts directly oppose the will of God. It's called iniquity. You know, there's a sin that we commit against God, but we also, Jesus Christ also paid for our iniquities. It's that thing inside of us just wants to do what we want to do. So we have to battle our own thoughts, and we have to battle the thoughts of the world. Let's play a little game, a little participation with me this morning. I'm going to throw out a slogan, and you tell me whose it is, okay? Okay? Oh, I got scared there. We weren't going to have any audience participation. Okay, um, have it your way. Burger King. Yep. Have it your way. You should have it the way that you want it. How about this one? Just do it. Nike, somebody's on it over here. Yeah, just do it. Don't think about the consequences. Don't worry about how it impacts other people. Just do it. One more. This is my favorite. Obey your thirst. Close. The other fizzy clear drink. Sprite. Sprite. There you go. Obey your thirst. It's, it's telling you, these messages are telling you what you have an appetite for, you should have it. If you want it, it should be yours. Obey your thirst. Just do it. Have it your way. This opposes how God tells us to live. We have an enemy battling for our mind. And then there's Satan himself. Constantly, from the beginning of humanity, his whole goal has been to make you distrust the goodness of God. So we have, we've got real war going on in our minds for what we're thinking. 24-7, we're being bombarded by sinful thoughts. You cannot fill your mind with ungodly entertainment, with filthy words and images and worldly thinking and expect your life to be holy and pleasing to God. The good news is you control your thoughts. Your thoughts do not control you. You have the power to stop thinking what you're thinking. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. You control what you think. Max Lucado in Anxious for Nothing describes it this way. He says, you are the air traffic controller of your mind. When thoughts come your way, you don't have to receive it. You can reject it. You can say, nope, you don't get to land here. Keep moving. Find another spot because you are not coming into my brain. I'm not allowing it. And you know that self-talk that you have in your mind, that ongoing stream of consciousness that never stops? You don't have to listen to it. It's probably, a lot of the times, not telling you the truth. Tell it, talk back. Talk back to your own self-talk. Tell it to stop. Say, that's not true, you're wrong, the Word of God says, and quote scripture back to that voice that's telling you what is in your head all the time. You can do that. You're actually responsible to do that. You're responsible for your thoughts. You can't blame anybody else for what you are thinking. God has given you free will to either receive or reject those thoughts. You can't even, you can't even blame God for it. You are responsible for what you choose to think. And what you choose to think become patterns of thinking. We have these neurological pathways in our mind. We think a thought, and it's like walking a path. You walk that path again, and you walk that path again. If I walked through the, the middle of the grass right out here in the front yard, and I did it every day, and I walked exactly the same way, before long, there would be a very well-worn path. And here's, this is kind of scary, guys, but our minds actually prefer what is familiar over what is new. Your mind would rather receive a familiar lie than think a new truth. This is important. These are mindsets that, get ha that happen when we create the pathways, right? We have mindsets. Our mind goes what's familiar. Our mind goes what's familiar. So if you're thinking in your mind, I, I sound so stupid, I'm just not going to speak out loud. That's the thought that is controlling your behavior. Your thoughts 
are controlling what you think. You are what you think. But old mindsets can be broken off and new pathways can be created in your thinking, but you have to intentionally choose the new thought over the old one. You have to fight for that. Romans 8, 6 says, For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. So set your mind on God. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Confirmation, conforming, it's just going through the motions. Paul's saying, don't just go through the motions of what the world is doing. And I think it's so interesting that he didn't say, don't conform to the world, conform to Christianity. That's not the goal either. It's not to act like we're Christians, but to be made different, to be changed, to be transformed from the inside out. The New Living Translation of this verse says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Changing the way you think. How do we do that, though? How do we change the way that we think? How do we get God's thoughts into our minds? Because Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says, my thoughts are not, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the, heaven, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. God's thoughts are completely other than mine. How am I supposed to get God's thoughts into my brain? Well, in Paul's letter to a different faith community, the, the church in Corinth, he wrote, for who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. And in 2 Corinthians 1.22, Paul says that God has set his seal of ownership on us and put his Spirit into our hearts. Did you catch that? No one knows the mind of God except the Spirit of God. God put the Spirit of God in you and in me. We have the mind of Christ. Romans 8, 6 says, oh, hang on just a minute. I'm jumping all over the place. Um, we can know the thoughts of God because we have the Spirit of God in us. You have the Spirit of God, you have the mind of Christ, and this is the best part of all. God wrote down what he thinks. We have the Word of God we get to meet with God. We get to talk with God. We get to share with him what's on our hearts, and then we get to open up his thoughts, and we get to let his thoughts get into our brain while his Holy Spirit says, yes, this is so good, <laughs> gives us clarity about what's being said here so that we can change our minds and so that we can live it out. And this looks different in every season of life, getting into God's word. I remember when you know, when the kids were little, and I had to have my quiet time, and it was just so hard. When they went down for a nap, that was my time. I don't care. I know the dishes were piled up. They needed to be done. I needed to be with Jesus. So I would take whatever time I could. When they grew out of naps, I made them have quiet time. You're going to spend 30 minutes by yourself. And I, you know, naively believed that they too were sitting with their, you know, sitting with their, their Bible on their bed, hearing from the Lord. Eden actually recently confessed to me that she would, she and Haven shared a room for a little while, and she said that before they came out of the bedroom, she'd go, Haven, come here, and she'd like ruffle up her hair real bad, so she looked like she'd been sleeping, and then they'd come downstairs. Oh, we had our quiet time. Yeah. Anyway, I needed that time with the Lord. When, they, when the kids had stuff going on, and they weren't driving, and I was the taxi, dra taxi driver, I kept a Bible and a devotional in the side door of my Suburban. So I used to hate the pickup line, like, ugh, just waiting, just made me crazy. Not anymore. Now I've got the Word of God. I can pull that out and I can read during the quiet times. So it looks different at different seasons. There's no one way to do that. Can I free you up from this real quick? There's no right way to read the Bible and wrong way to, to read the Bible other than if you're not getting it out, anything out of it, there's a better way, Okay. There's a better way. God wants to meet with you when you open up the word. He wants to let you know what he's thinking and he wants to, to change your thoughts. He wants to change your mindsets. He wants to release you from strongholds. You can listen to the Bible if reading is hard for you, but get into God's word. Have a plan and read the whole thing. Read the whole thing. 
New Testament, Old Testament, all of it. It's so good. And every piece of it is for you to know the heart of God and to fall in love with him even more. If you don't know where to start with this, ask. Ask me, ask Dan, ask anybody on staff, ask people you see in leadership. Ask and learn how to sit with the Lord. When I was 13 years old, I grew up in a Christian household, but when I was 13 years old, I committed my life to Jesus and said, if nobody else is gonna follow you, Jesus, I'm gonna follow you. And I had seen time and time again that my older sister, four years older than me, was sitting on her waterbed, <laughs> her waterbed, I'm dating myself big time here, with her Bible open and her markers and such, and she was reading God's words. So I knocked on the door and I was like, Jody, what are you doing? She goes, I'm reading my Bible. I said, I know but I need to know what you're doing. I need to learn how to nurture a relationship with the Lord. I need to learn how to read the Bible. And she taught me how. I have been reading the Word of God now for 40 years. 40 years this October, it will be daily. And not perfectly, it's not about having a track record, it's not about ticking them off, you don't get any streaks or anything. It's just about getting nourished from the Word of God because that's what happens when we dive into God's Word. You, you may read the Word of God. Maybe you're thinking, Shauna, I've tried reading the Bible and I just don't, it just doesn't do anything for me. I just, I just didn't, I didn't like it. Well, not every time you read the Bible are you gonna get goosebumps and have a revelation. Can I just be honest about that real quick? Not every time, but you're getting nourished Nonetheless, you're getting spiritually nourished with the thoughts of God. They're making their way into your brain. They're changing the way that you think it's going to change your life. Not every meal you eat is Thanksgiving dinner. Sometimes you wake up and you're like, piece of toast, slap some jam on there. It'll, it'll do, right? Like, it's not your favorite, but you got nourished. Get into God's Word. Get into God's Word regularly and daily. You guys, when I was telling you this morning about the sky and how amazing it was. I'm, I could spend the rest of the day trying to describe to you how there, it was just this blanket of darkness and brightness and, and the moon, I mean, it was so amazing. I could, I could spend a week trying to figure out how to articulate to you how amazing what I saw was. It is not the same as experiencing it. I wish I could have called every single one of you this morning and said, go outside right now. Go look at the sky. Like, I can't, I can tell you what I saw. I can tell you what I experienced. I can tell you why it mattered to me. But I want you to experience it yourself. It's not the same if you just hear it from me. You need to experience being in God's word. You do. You need to be alone with the Father. He loves you and he wants to spend time with you one-on-one, -on -one. not to tap me on the shoulder and tell you what he thinks, but for you to hear it from his heart. We need to be in God's word. We need to be memorizing scripture. Oh, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. When my dad was in his final days, his mind was not working well. It wasn't healthy, and that man could recite scripture without skipping a beat. I'm telling you, there is something about getting the Word of God into your mind. I, I'm so passionate about this, you guys, because it has changed my life. Reading God's Word has changed my life. I've shared with you a little bit about how I've battled with anxiety. When I was in my 20s, I finished every day by laying in bed and looking back on my day and reminding myself of all the stupid things I said, of all the foolish things I did, how ridiculous I looked when I did this, and how ridiculous I looked when I did that. And I basically like self-abused myself to sleep. And I don't know if you know this or not, but last, Joanne, I think you were there, last October I got to hear a, a brain surgeon speak and he was speaking about how our brains work. And he said, when you go to sleep at night, your brain doesn't have a pause button. Your brain keeps going. And what it does is it just loops whatever your last conscious thought was. Eight, six hours for however long you're asleep, that thought will continue to have impact 
on your mind and on your body all through the night while you sleep. So if that thought is a negative thought, all the chemicals that your brain releases into your body get released all night long. Flip to today. <laughs> I have this, the Lectio 365 devotional, which we do the prayer every Sunday together. That prayer is from the morning prayers, but they also have nighttime prayers. And in the nighttime prayers, this is the last thing that I do every night before I go to bed. You know, I'm in bed, got the covers up, the lights are off, I hit play on Lectio 365 nighttime prayers, and then the glasses come off. <laughs> got to be able to see the button. And then I reflect on my day and the ways where God spoke to me, the places that I saw God in the day. I do think about the times that I disappointed him and that I sinned against him, and then I repent, and I receive his forgiveness, and I receive the Father's love for me. I get to go to sleep with his comfort and his peace and his love washing over me. And sometimes I don't even make it to the end of the prayer thing. I don't care. <laughs> What's looping through my mind all night long is the goodness of God, the presence of God. Here's the thing. I'm different. I am not who I used to be at all. And the thing that happened in between here and here is the word of God. He changed my mind. He changed my life. There's a quote from the movie The Chosen. Mary Magdalene is getting, kind of getting pressed by Nicodemus. He sees her and she's radically different, right? And he's like, I don't understand. He's pressing her and he says, why are you so different? And she said, I was one way and now I'm completely different and the thing that happened in between was him. Are you different? Are you different? Are you changed? Have you been transformed by meeting with God in his word? I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I urge you, get into God's word. Let him change your mind. I'm gonna pray a prayer that I came across right now, and I'm gonna invite you to pray it with me. I'm gonna do it, um, it'll, I'm gonna use the words I. Make it your own prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, I take responsibility for my own mind. I take authority over my thoughts, feelings, meditations, and imagination. I own the thoughts and images that I allow to play on the screen of my mind. Satan cannot force me to think, feel, or meditate on anything that I refuse to permit. My mind is a gift from God, and I choose to fill it with thoughts that will draw me into the life that God has planned for me. When our minds are rooted in the truth, our lives will be rooted in transformation. If we change our minds, we will change our lives. And if we change our lives, God can change the world through us. Let's pray. God, we love you so much. Thank you for giving us a plan. If you had just said, I want you to give your whole life to me, I want you to change your whole life, and you didn't tell us how, that would just be so devastating. That would be so disheartening, Father. But you, you gave us a way. You gave us your word. Father, we're, we're trusting you for this. As we dive into your word, as we meet with you daily, Change us. Transform us. Where we're stuck in our ways of thinking, God, free us to be able to, to choose the truth and to believe the truth. We love you and we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>